Hi everybody and welcome to the Lower Grand Coulee here in North Central Washington. I've got ice age floods on the brain. I've got some new thoughts to share with you, some new discoveries, and all those new thoughts and new discoveries are coming from work that was done a hundred years ago. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started. Okay, it's uh, early Thursday afternoon here and this is uh, Lake Lenore cave trailhead. It's a couple of uh, well, uh, well manicured uh, hiking trails to go up along uh, the east wall of the lower Grand Coulee. You're looking south right now and we're just going to do a short little walk up here in the talus but looking to the southeast, excuse me, looking to the southwest across to the other side of the lower Grand Coulee. I hope that you can see these wonderful scallops and to me, that's very exciting to see these. How do I describe it? Uh, there's sheer black cliffs, but it's not a continuous wall, right? There's these uh, upper kind of light green to tan surfaces that are more contoured. And most striking are these V-shaped cuts. And each of those V-shaped cuts is a hanging valley a pre-glacial stream that once upon a time worked its way all the way to the floor of a pre-glacial river valley that Richard Waite calls Cooley Creek. Pre-glacial, pre three million years ago. But for us today, we're focusing on the fact that that pre-glacial kind of subtle landscape, that mature landscape is no longer. And instead there was intense cutting where we have sheer walls as a result of very energetic water coming through here and carving the place up pretty darn good uh, let's just take a little walk here and get a sense on the east wall that we have plenty of basalt bedrock and I'm leading you towards a couple of uh, old diagrams and old uh, publications that I want to share with you well, let's just get our sense of walking on these uh, rubbly talus surfaces and you can see that damn near everything right here is full of vesicles. So this is basalt lava from 16 million years ago and the lava in place is one layer on stacked on top of another the German chocolate cake uh, but there's plenty of talus which we can get into and J. Harlan Bretz, a hundred years ago, was thinking a lot about these talus surfaces, these talus accumulations tucked up here against the wall, the high wall of the lower Grand Coulee and the upper Grand Coulee. I guess I can't hold it. Uh, in addition to these horizontal layers that are that were once continuous across the entire area before the coulee was cut. Uh, there are some key places where the layers have been tilted and you can see that there's a bit of a slope to some of these layers. So there is a little bit of folding in here which I didn't give much thought to, terrible grammar, until recently. And I think I'm newly interested in these gentle warps in the Grand Coulee country. Changing light conditions for you. Just for fun, let's continue up here just a bit. Some of the Geology 351 students will be joining me in about an hour. I'm making a short video as I wait for them. So if you're unfamiliar, talus is just a pile of loose rubble. And we can't make a pile of loose rubble until we create a space for it. So we're really talking about the fact that we're removing a lot of bedrock quickly and then we've got these steep walls of the Grand Coulee 
that are going to freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw over the last tens of thousands of years and we're going to create these piles of loose rubble. Okay, let's swing you around to the other side and then I'll share a couple of these old publications with you. Swinging you to the west, looking directly across to the west wall of the lower Grand Coulee. I think I'm going to go back here. Nice little grassy spot with some crickets and uh, I'll set up shop and uh, read to you. Cheat grass dead already. My God, it's June 1st. Things are drying out. As predicted. So I don't know if you've been uh, keeping up with the channel, but I've been posting a few videos within the last few days reporting that school is about done, the spring term, uh, but we've been thinking about the Ice Age floods in our class the entire term. And now that I have more free time, being the end of the uh, rigid teaching schedule, uh, I'm just gonna go out here pretty regularly and follow up on a bunch of things I'm intrigued by. And so every morning, there's new thoughts and every morning there's leads to follow and this morning was no exception 5 30 this morning check the email get an email from Sharon in Colville Washington and if you remember back to the pandemic videos Sharon from Colville sent a beautiful box of rock samples from northeastern Washington when I was first starting to learn about the exotic terrains and I featured that box of samples where she carefully located uh, the collecting sites and also gave me details on the Addy Quartzite and other things. So special thanks to Sharon. I don't hear from her that often, but she saw the video I made the other day where I am now thinking carefully about two ice advances coming into Washington and the older of the two ice advances potentially doing much of the carving in the Scablands of Eastern Washington. That's new to me. And so Sharon, by email this morning, said, uh, I'm not sure you know about it, this paper from J. Harlan Bretz in 1924, but I'm sending it to you because I found it online yesterday. And I've got it on my phone. I want to read to you uh, a paper that I don't think I had seen before. And this is after me and the students for the last two months stumbling into this idea that the Spokane glaciation happened before the Wisconsin glaciation. And just before I read this to you, if you didn't catch the last couple videos, viewers, most everybody has heard about the Ice Age floods in the Pacific Northwest and most everybody realizes that the story as it's been told is in the starting 20,000 years ago and going till about 13,000 years ago. But I'm now realizing that that's the last chapter, the youngest chapter in the Ice Age flood story. And you're like, of course it is. The older chapters is when you make the lavas and everything else. No, 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 no. I'm on to this idea that I've somehow missed over the last 30 years <laughs> that there were earlier chapters in the Ice Age of coolie carving and bigger, thicker ice and bigger, more angry floodwaters than the youngest advance. So let's hear it from Brett's in his own words. This is from a paper, 1924, J. Harlan Bretz, University of Chicago. Title of the paper, Age of Spokane Glaciation, 1924. I'm going to read you the first paragraph. The northern part of the Columbia Basalt Plateau in Washington has been glaciated at least twice. 
During both glaciations, the drainage from the southern margin of the ice sheet was deflected southward across the plateau, right here. During the earlier, or Spokane, glaciation, the volume of the waters was very great, and the plateau's southward slope was severely scoured along dozens of large channels, like this one. During the later, or Wisconsin, glaciation, the volume of escaping waters appears to have been far less. Due to this lesser volume and the failure of the later ice sheet to reach as far as the earlier, only two of the older glacial drainages ways were used. Only two of the older glacial drainage ways were used. And then he goes on to talk about talus and the height of the talus going up to the walls of the older uh, flooding event and the younger flooding event. So if you're really up on your Ice Age flood stuff, you totally followed that. You can see what I'm talking about. You can see the excitement if this is a new idea for you like it is to me, even though the work was done 100 years ago. But I want to flip you around and show you another old publication. Thanks again to Sharon for that. And a viewer sent me this gift through the mail a few years ago. I'm sorry, I can't remember who sent it to me. But I was always intrigued by those illustrations. And I want to share them with you now. Because, to be honest, I'm going through everything that I have. Every paper that I have. Old, new. In other words, Ice Age floods research that's been done incrementally over the last 100 years. I'm reading all that stuff with a new set of eyes and ears because I'm thinking about these older chapters really for the first time. I even have a color scheme. <laughs> I've got everything printed out and I'm coloring with a certain color for each generation or chapter of Ice Age flooding event. It's energizing, it's fun, and I'm just gonna keep going. You're like, wait a minute, school's done. Shouldn't you be on summer vacation sitting in like uh, grilling brats and uh, going on your pontoon boat with your wife? Well, A, I don't have a pontoon boat. B, I'm kind of maxed out on brats, to be honest. And C, this is my idea of a good time. Sorry. If that makes me boring, it makes me boring. This is what turns me on. This is what energizes me. Not sitting, staring into space. No offense. <laughs> okay. So, let's flip you around and look at this beautiful old book. Okay, so I'm sharing it with you now because... I just found it on my bookshelf. I suppose I'm going to, if I, if I continue to be excited about this, I'll scan this properly and get these into some sort of more polished talk. But for right now, let's just go ahead and do it out here in the field. So you're looking at the Grand Coulee in real life. Again, we've got the basalts. And uh, here is the book. It's a, it's a thin little book. I don't know the backstory on it at all, except it's probably tied to some sort of propaganda for the power of man and the building of the Grand Coulee Dam. But this is by Fred Jones, Fred C. Jones. Grand Coulee, Hell to Breakfast, a story of Columbia River from molten lavas and ice to the Grand Coulee Dam, 1947. And no offense, Fred, but the, the real uh, excitement for me comes from these drawings by Charles W. Zach. The Geology of the Grand Coulee. And I noticed in the acknowledgments, uh, this author uh, ran this by Richard Foster Flint and J. Harlan Bretz and a few others. Okay, so here's our north arrow. So again, I'm used to looking at it like, I don't know, maybe I'll do it like this. So here's the more familiar look to me. And the brown, of course, are the Columbia Plateau lavas, the German chocolate cake. So Wenatchee is here, Ellensburg's kind of over in here, and out here in the middle of this basaltic plain is the Grand Coulee, which we can split into the lower Grand Coulee, where we're sitting right now. We're sitting right up above Lake Lenore. So that's Lake Lenore. We are downstream. Come on, Gizmo. Come on, Gizmo. We are 
to the south or downstream of Dry Falls. But then there's an upper Grand Coulee with Steamboat Rock sitting in the middle of it. And that upper Grand Coulee opens up to the Columbia River Valley up by the Grand Coulee Dam. And with the exception of this little cute little triangle of basalt north of the Columbia River uh, up towards Omac Lake, with the exception of that, uh, the Columbia is this beautiful gutter that rims the margin of the CRB, the German chocolate cake. Okay, so here's a map showing the ice sheet encroaching into this basaltic picture. If you're a fan of this story, this is not news to you, that the Okanagan Lobe crosses the Columbia Valley. It dams it with ice. This is not the famous ice dam of northern Idaho, but this is another ice dam creating Glacial Lake Columbia. And so suddenly now a quote-unquote swollen Columbia River comes down and starts carving the upper and the lower Grand Coulee. That water dumps into the Quincy Basin. It leaks into the Columbia River at various places like Frenchman Coulee, Potholes Coulee, the Gorge Amphitheater, and uh, Drumheller Channels over here as well. Okay, that's not really why I'm showing you this. I'm showing you this because there's a beautiful cross section. So are you still with me? We're going to look at, the last thing we're going to do, if you're losing patience, is that we're going to look at some illustrations along a cross section. So this red line is going right from Soap Lake through the lower Grand Coulee, right where we're sitting, through Dry Falls area, through the upper floor of the upper Grand Coulee, and getting all the way over to Grand Coulee Dam. If you're not sure what a cross section line is, it's basically a, a slice. So this is like a cut, and now we're going to look at some illustrations about what's underneath this red line. Like if we could somehow cut this with a knife, pull all this stuff away, and look at the wall of our cut. That's what we're going to see. And it's a cartoon, and it's an illustration. What's, what's the difference? And it's, it's, it's showing uh, this slice at different times. So here's back during the lava flow time, where these lava flows are coming from Oregon and flowing into this scene. And you can see that there was kind of a granitic, rugged landscape uh, that dominated this area. No longer, it's underneath the lavas. You're like, oh really, is it? Well, here we go, here we go. That, that former world, that former series of granitic hills and valleys is totally buried by the German chocolate cake. 16 million year old lava flows. And the yellows are some lake beds that were deposited in some local uh, low spots. Uh, late, I can't read quickly. I think these are the Leita uh, lake beds that have some beautiful fossils in them. Yep, Leita shales. Still, that's not why I'm showing this to you. Still, we haven't done any Ice Age flooding yet. We haven't formed any cool, coolie carving yet, but we're about to. This is why I'm, I guess, really for the first time seriously interested in these folds. And I know that the Cooley monocline keeps getting talked about, but maybe till this week, I didn't really see why that fold was important. Well, now I'm seeing that where we folded the German chocolate cake here and here are places that we're going to create some waterfalls. Somehow I didn't have that in my head before. I should have, I just, I don't think I did. Is this exaggerated? Probably. But this is where we're going to carve the upper Grand Coulee, and this is where we're going to carve the lower Grand Coulee. And so if you're losing it, today's Soap Lake, the little town of Soap Lake is here. Today's Dry Falls is here. Today's uh, Steamboat Rock is, is over here, and the Grand Coulee Dam is here. Next slide. Well, here we go. Now, this is where I think the current thinking differs a little bit from this 1947 book. This, car this illustration, I guess, approved by both Bretts and Flint, although maybe they didn't care that much, is that we have uh, two waterfalls happening simultaneously. A waterfall at where Dry Falls is today, but this is not actual Dry Falls, I'll explain. 
and this waterfall, which is at today's Soap Lake. Again, you're going to start these. I'm going to tell this to the students in, in 45 minutes and show this to them. I think they'll be interested. In other words, we're going to form the upper Grand Coulee here. We're going to form the lower Grand Coulee here. And you know what I'm doing with my fingers. Once we start a waterfall, each major flood is going to beat up that waterfall rim and move it. In other words, we're going to eat away a bunch of the waterfall rim and we're going to move the waterfall rim itself further to the north. Same thing here, but I think the difference is that today it sounds like, and maybe even back then, it sounds like Brett's and today's geologists think that the upper Grand Coulee waterfall retreat happened long before the lower Grand Coulee waterfall retreat. But in this illustration, both are happening at the same time. And you're like, I didn't see the waterfall thing before. Well, now you do. And now you can see this incredible plunge pool. And now we can see for the first time some very coarse gravels. So in other words, if we start breaking off this waterfall rim, column by column, and we bust up those columns, we're going to start making graveyards of those busted Tootsie Rolls here and here. And, and you can see we're starting to move both this lower falls and this upper falls back together. Are they in sync? Are they moving in sync? Doesn't sound like it anymore, but let's not get hung up on it. Well, now, by the time we get done with this waterfall rim, we're going to eat this thing back all the way to today's Grand Coulee Dam, which means we're going to just totally move this giant waterfall north to the point where we lose it completely because we run out of basalt. Let's just peek ahead. This is a key part that they just skipped past. But by here, we've, we've totally lost that upper waterfall. Remember? That, that, that waterfall was here, right above this left of the two giant pink things. And here's the left of the two giant pink things, and we totally have that waterfall gone. The basalt's been totally chewed away. So this is the famous breach or opening up of the upper Grand Coulee. And many modern geologists are trying to figure out exactly when did that upper Grand Coulee totally open up to the Columbia River Valley. Because when we do that, and when we have a, a low floor to the upper Grand Coulee, that's going to be a major, rather significant, permanent siphon for any water coming from Montana since that time. Again, the timing is not accurate, I think, from where we view it today, but the point is we're doing this waterfall retreat in both places, and I think it's really effective to show this. Well, but here we go. This is, I suppose, Flint and Brett saying, that's fine with these cartoons, but you better bring in the ice one more time. You better bring in the Wisconsin ice, which is wimpy compared to the Spokane ice, which is the opposite of wimpy. And so the idea is, from the 1920s, and especially Brett's work, he says, yeah, you've got a last glacial maximum younger than 20,000 years ago, but you're not doing major carving at that time. And if you are, it's probably retreating today's dry falls, which is a small falls compared to the former upper Grand Coulee major waterfall. Oh, yeah, he does. He, he, this guy died in 1947. He still does have the lower... Okay. So he does have the lower Grand Coulee still developing after we totally get done with the upper Grand Coulee. So I, I, I change my tune here with you, viewer. I guess these guys are showing that the finishing of the carving of this lower Grand Coulee is a Wisconsin story. It's a younger than 20,000-year-old story. But in case you, if you missed the headline, it seems like this story goes back hundreds of thousands of years earlier. Hundreds of thousands of years earlier. And that is the surprise to me here in late May and early June. We finally get to today's scene. I'll zoom in to give you some detail and then we'll say goodbye to each other today. Yeah, this is still true. 
all these lakes that you may know in the lower Grand Coulee, Dry Falls, a baby compared to the upper Grand Coulee Dry Falls. Kind of interesting, huh? Town of Coulee City and so on. And look at how, many, how much gravel material from that upper Grand Coulee waterfall retreat is apparently sitting below Banks Lake today. That's a surprise to me. And here we go. We'll flip you around and say goodbye. So, let me try to crystallize my thoughts before we say goodbye. At least two glaciations. The earlier glaciation happening tens to maybe hundreds of thousands of years before 20,000 years ago. And that older glaciation, which Brecht called the Spokane glaciation and Doi called the Spokane flood and never put those two things together. But now in print in 1922, the thing that Sharon sent by email, he's saying it in print. That older glaciation is correlative with an older Ice Age flood, which has way more volume, way more carving possibility, carving power, than the last chapter, the youngest chapter, the Wisconsin chapter. And you're like, I still don't think I understand why I should be excited. Let me try to put it differently before we say goodbye. All of these new dates that we have from the, the tephra layers, from the OSL dates within the slack water sediments in Washington, in the OSL new dates we have from the floor of Glacial Lake Missoula, the surface exposure dates from the erratics that are found scattered all through here. It's all exciting new work, but all of those dates are coming from the young, apparently minor, chapter of flooding and minor chapter of ice advance. I want to know more and more about the older, bigger story. And perhaps there's more than two. Perhaps there's three or four generations of ice advance and ice age flooding. If there's any hint of teasing out those multiple advances and multiple floods, that's going to be the general theme I'm working on, just for my own enjoyment this summer. Hope you can join me for some of those. No Starlink today, old school gizmo and phone, but hope you enjoyed this one. Thank you, I love you, and goodbye from the Lower Grand Coulee in North Central Washington, USA. <laughs>